Okay, I, I think we'll make a start at that point. So, hello, welcome to our webinar. So today we're talking about getting your will and estate plan in order. Thank you for your company, we really appreciate that. So my name is Peter Webb, I'm the International Tax Manager for the Fry Group, and I'm talking to you from Singapore today. And shortly I'm going to introduce our main speaker, Steve Wright. So just to reiterate, what we're talking about today, the really important message today, is how important it is to get your will and estate plan in order. And before we go too much further, just a couple of housekeeping points for you. So first of all, if you would like a copy of the slides, then you can ask for those and our contact details will come up at the end. And if you want to ask any questions as we go through, there's a Q&A button. So please do ask questions that occur to you as we go through. And what we're gonna do at the end is we'll pick up on as many of those as we can. Okay, so before I hand over to Steve as the tax man, I'm just going to make a couple of comments about inheritance tax. Having a well thought, well thought through plan for your will and estate can be a great way to reduce your inheritance tax bill. But why do I care about inheritance tax? Well, let's just work our way through this little exam question I've put on the slide for you. So we have Robert and Catherine. Their estate is worth 3.15 million pounds. So Robert dies first and he leaves everything to Catherine. Very sad, but no tax is charged at that time. But Catherine dies and she leaves everything to their child, Damien. So 3.15 million is left to Damien. So how much inheritance tax will be charged when Catherine dies? And actually, do you know what? That's my question for you. So you're going to see that come up on your screen now and you're gonna have a chance to answer the question. So how much inheritance tax is charged when Catherine passes away? I'll just give you a few seconds to actually answer that. So the question is not which dodgy 1970s horror film am I referencing on this slide, but how much tax is there to pay when Catherine passes away? Okay. So I just get lots and lots of people voting, lots and lots of interesting answers. Okay, we're, we, oh, lots of people still want to take part in this. We have a, a large number of people participating today and that's absolutely great to see. Okay, so I think we're probably getting there. Just give you two more seconds and I think we'll leave that there and we'll publish the poll. Okay, so 18% of you went for £800,000. That's a lot of money, uh, but it's wishful thinking. 17% of you went for £900,000. Again, wishful thinking. Most of you got this right. It's a million pounds in inheritance tax, which is payable when Catherine passes away. And that's why we need to mention inheritance tax. We've helped countless families reduce their inheritance tax bill. And, and, and of course, we can help you too. Okay, thank you very much. And we just... Okay, if we can get rid of the polling question. There we go. And okay. So I'm, I'm just going to do one more slide before we hand over to Steve. And this is when a copy of Under Milk would cost a million pounds. A very sad story. So Sir Richard Burton, for the, the older participants, you'll remember him well. He died in Switzerland in the summer of 1984. Now his plan to escape inheritance tax was to claim that Wales was no longer his home country, 
and that Switzerland had become his permanent home. Now, if that plan had worked, he would have gone from being liable to inheritance tax on his worldwide assets, everything he had, to only being liable on his UK assets. And he had millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars, in a Bermudan bank account. And if his plan had worked, those millions of dollars would have been free from tax. So what went wrong? His coffin was draped in the Welsh flag, and he had requested that he was buried with a copy of Under Milk Wood tucked under his arm. So HM Revenue was successfully able to argue that Sir Richard Burton still thought of Wales as his home country. So his plan failed at that point. Okay. So, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Steve. So a little introduction to Steve for you. So Steve Wright, he's our director of our estates and trust team, and he's based in our UK head office. So Steve has been with the Fry Group for 23 years, and for more than 30 years, he's been helping expats with their will and estate planning. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to look at uh, today primarily how to structure your will. Um, but before we get to that stage, we're going to be looking at um, why you need to have a will in place and also which law should actually apply to that will. And because our, our client base uh, is around the world, so we regularly come across questions about non-domiciled spouses and what the implications are with, with those. So we're going to touch upon that briefly. Um, another topic which always comes up, questions about multiple wills. So do you need to have a will in every single jurisdiction that you own an asset? And we'll touch upon the, the, the pros and the cons for that. Um, we're also going to then look at the main part, which is really how to structure your, your will. And it's largely a template. So for those that, you, that do have a will in place at the moment, um, you can perhaps check to see whether the points that I raise here are actually covered in your will, and maybe those that have not quite ventured out in getting a will in place, then hopefully these points will help you. We're then going to touch upon what an executor actually has to do when administering an estate. And then uh, finally, we'll have a look at uh, some, some questions from the floor as well. Uh, the whole presentation will be around about 35 minutes. Um, and, then, and then as I say, it'll be time for some questions at the end. So let's let's go straight with the question, why is will needed? Um, seems like quite a straightforward question, actually, and probably quite a straightforward answer. And, and the top point is the key one here. It's largely to ensure that your assets pass to those people that you want to benefit. I mean, that's ultimately what you're trying to do here, is to ensure that your chosen beneficiaries do receive your assets. The second point is obviously to avoid the intestacy rules. And by that, and I'm, I'm largely going to look at the UK here, you know, as far as this presentation is concerned. In the UK, there are certain rules in place which govern how an estate is actually distributed where there, there is no will in place. So if we take, for example, a husband and wife situation, they have children, and unfortunately one of those spouses dies. In that event, if there is no will in place, um, the personal chattels that are owned by the deceased will pass to the surviving spouse. They will also receive £270,000 worth of assets. So that's a legacy, effectively. And then everything else that's owned by the deceased is then split into two pots. One pot will pass to the surviving spouse and the other will pass to the children. Any joint assets, they will automatically pass to the surviving spouse. There's no problem there. So it's just to be aware of that, that that might not be what you want to happen. And that sort of leads us on to the third point about reducing the impact of inheritance tax, because obviously if that were to happen, you can see that potentially there might be a charge to inheritance tax in respect of the assets that pass to the children. Everything passing to the spouse, as long as they have the same domicile status as, as the deceased, 
will be free from UK inheritance tax. So it's not a problem. But it's just really to overcome those intestacy rules and the possible inheritance tax implications of that, best to get a will in place. The fourth point, if you do have minor children, um, then the will can indicate exactly who you'd like to look after your children. And we're gonna come on to that a little bit later. And lastly, if there are vulnerable beneficiaries, and by that, I mean children, certainly, um, spendthrifts, so you, you know there might be somebody that you want to leave the funds to, but they're not very good with money, then actually the use of a trust might be helpful. So again, you don't have to leave it absolutely to the beneficiaries, it can go into some form of trust. And again, we'll touch upon that in a bit. In a bit. Next slide, please, thank you. So before we get to the main uh, topic really, which is what, what needs to be included within the will, we're gonna have a look at which law actually applies to your will. And as far as the UK is concerned, this is gonna come down to two main aspects. One is where you are currently domiciled, and the other one is where you own real estate. So bricks and mortar and land. So under UK law, your will is effectively administered in accordance with the law of the country in which you're domiciled. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about domicile because we could be here all day. It is a, a completely separate subject. And uh, as I say, we could do a whole webinar on that. But basically, you take your domicile from your father, from your legitimate father at birth, and that stays with you until you decide to settle somewhere else permanently or indefinitely and physically move there. And that then becomes a domicile of choice. And you have to effectively cut off um, from your original domicile. So you'd have to cut all your ties with the UK and basically um, fill your, you know, make your ties with, with the country of your choice. So it's, it's quite difficult to, to lose. So the advice that we would say, give, you know, give you is go and complete a will in accordance with the law where you're domiciled to cover your worldwide assets, but also consider taking advice in any other country where you own property, real estate. Um, and the reason for that is that English law basically says that the, uh, the overseas property, bricks and mortar and land, will always be dealt with in accordance with local law. So that's the first point under the heading overseas property. The other point I, I, I put in there, the EU succession regulation, this came into force back in 2015. And the idea behind it was that one law, one court, one jurisdiction was going to apply to all the EU member states. Now the advantage of this, and again, I won't go into detail here, but the advantage is that you can now choose the law of your nationality to apply to property that is in the EU, you know, an EU member state. So for instance, if a UK resident, uh, a UK domiciliary owns a property say in France, they can actually elect under their will to have English law applying to that French property. Um, I don't think the French notaires are that keen on it, but uh, that is how it is. Um, so there are, I'm, I'm sure there will be court proceedings, you know, as far as this is concerned, but that is the understanding on both sides of the channel. Next slide, please, Peter. Thank you. I want to touch upon the position for non-domiciled spouses. Um, again, here, if we're looking at English law and, and indeed Scottish law, actually, then you should be looking to take the advice in the country where they're domiciled. Um, so our, our advice would be go and get that advice. And the chances are they, they will then say to you, get a will completed in that particular country. Um, now, there are other reasons why you might want to do that. And it's largely to protect against UK inheritance tax. Now, for basically a non-UK domiciliary is actually taxed only on those assets in the UK. So you can see the advantage here. If you complete a will for that non-domiciled spouse, in the country where they're domicile, it's further evidence to state that I don't want my state dealt with in accordance with UK law. And the HM, and HMRC um, will find it difficult then to go after you for tax, you know, for being taxed in, in, in the UK. Your UK assets will always be taxed in the UK. It's just those outside the UK. 
Um, the third point, does the non-domicile spouse any, own any UK property? If they do, then I would say get a UK will put in place, but restricted to assets in the UK. And if they own joint property, we do sometimes get the query, well, it's held jointly, it will always pass by survivorship. That is true. But what happens in the event that they die shortly after their spouse and they've not had the time to complete a will? In that scenario, the intestacy rules will then kick in. So I would say, if you do own a property, if a non-domiciled spouse does own a property, whether it be jointly or in their sole name, still get a will completed here. Next one, please, Peter. Thank you. So we talked about possibly the need to um, have separate wills in different jurisdictions if there are multiple assets. Now, there are advantages with that, and there's certainly disadvantages in, in having multiple wills. The advantage is that if you have a will in every jurisdiction where you own an asset, it will be dealt with quicker because what will happen is those wills can be presented to the various courts and you won't need to get a, a grant of probate which would probably have been obtained in the UK resealed in that different jurisdiction. If you rely on one will then obviously you have to go to each jurisdiction to get it resealed which, which can take longer. However, I personally believe that there are more disadvantages, well I mean you'll see that on the slide, I think they outweigh the advantage to that. There is a cost in getting those wills prepared in the first place. And that could be quite pricey if you've got various assets in different jurisdictions. It can become complex. So for instance, one will might end up revoking the other will. You have to ensure that they all sit nicely with one another. If they don't, then there is a danger. And I have seen it on many occasions, one later will revokes the others because the person that drew up the will hadn't realized that there was another will in place. The third point, if you amend one will, as, you know, assuming that you leave your estate in exactly the same way, then obviously you're going to have to change all the other wills. And we then go back to the first point about the cost aspect. And lastly, if you are going to appoint different executors in different locations, then there seems to me to be a loss of control. So my advice to you would be certainly have the will completed in accordance with your domicile to cover your worldwide assets and that can cover your bank accounts your investments in different jurisdictions and then have another will where you own real estate so let's now look at um, exactly what needs to go into the will, the things that you need to think about. And before we come on to how the assets are going to be distributed, we're going to look at a few other aspects as well. So we've already talked about the first point, which law is going to apply to your will. Um, so it's going to come down to where you're domiciled and where you own bricks and mortar and land. There's a couple of points there. The first point if you are making a will, say, in the USA or Canada or indeed Australia, then the chances are that the will might be restricted to the state in which that property is actually held. If that's the case, then your main will, perhaps in the UK, will cover everything outside that state. So that's just something to bear in mind. Again, take advice in, in the state. They will be able to advise you better than we will be able to. You also need to think about uh, the EU succession regulation. So if you do own a property, say, in a, an EU member state, do I need to elect in my will to ensure that English law or, or indeed Scottish law applies? So that's just something to uh, think about. In terms of executors and, and who you appoint, that's very much a personal decision. How many you appoint, again, is entirely up to you. Just a couple of points on that though. Firstly, as far as the UK is concerned, you can only name four executors on the grant of probate. So only four will, you know, will be able to be, be named on that grant. You can have as many executors as you like, however, I would say don't have too many. The reason for that, quite simply, is it's be going to become an administrative nightmare if you have too many people involved. They will all have to sign the forms, they will all have to apply for the probate. 
Um, so you just need to be careful. And also, if your executors are around the globe, again, it's going to take longer to administer. As to whether you appoint uh, family friends or maybe a professional, again, entirely up to you. I think there's certainly a place, and perhaps it's a biased opinion, but I, was, I, I think there is a place for a professional either to work in a sole capacity or possibly um, alongside family members or indeed friends. Um, I would also say for a married couple, I would always appoint the surviving spouse. It keeps them involved in the estate. No decisions can be made without their, their approval. In terms of funeral wishes, um, again, this is entirely up to you as to whether or not you include something in your will. I would certainly say go with the first point. Um, it, it's something which, as a nation, we're just rubbish at. You know, we just don't discuss this with our families at all. And I hold up my hands now, and I, I have no idea what my wife wants to do in terms of her, her um, uh, funeral. So, you know, I would encourage you all to discuss it with your family, but uh, also include something in, in your will. State whether you're going to be cremated or buried, and you could go as far as to whether you want those ashes scattered somewhere or indeed your body buried. Um, the other points on there, you can include within the will. That's absolutely fine. But the problem with that is that if you change your mind over a particular aspect, then you're going to have to change the will and go to, you know, to the cost of preparing a new will. I would say just have a side letter. And that can be then changed as time goes by. You might change your mind over perhaps you know, certain aspects of funerals, certain hymns, for instance. Um, so have a side letter. You can change that later, but make sure it's kept with the, the will itself. For those that have got minor children, again, most people would use their will to indicate who they want to, to leave those children to. And um, again, as to who you, you, know, you choose, that's entirely up to you. They have to be people that you trust, obviously. Um, but I think you also need to think about their ages. Uh, you know, if you're going to be appointing parents, for instance, it could be a number of years before those children attain the age of 18. At that point, the guardians won't, won't be acting. Are they going to be able to act at that age? If not, then looking at the third point there, we'll come back to the second one in a minute, the third point, substitute guardians. I would say to you, if you think that there's a chance that they may not be able to act, include additional guardians so they can step in in the event that your firstly chosen guardians can't act. The other point is that if you are living in an overseas country, it might be worth appointing temporary guardians. So those guardians will be the ones that will immediately take over your children to look after them until your chosen guardians arrive. Um, I think that's quite important, especially at the moment with t travel being disrupted. Um, so certainly include temporary guardians if you do live in an overseas jurisdiction. And lastly, you can indicate in your will um, whether you've got certain guidance to the guardians. And by that, I mean, maybe if you have certain, um, you know, re uh, religious beliefs or um, schooling, things like that, that, you know, you want them to go to university if possible. And also whether you want to leave those guardians any money or possibly uh, an indication to the trustees exactly whether you would be happy, for instance, for funds to be paid to the guardians in the form of a loan, for instance, to improve a property. You know, things like that. Again, I probably wouldn't include it in the body of the will itself, but maybe have it as a side letter. Provision for pets. Now here, I don't mean giving money to the pets. Um, you have to remember that a pet is an asset effectively. So is there somebody that you would specifically like to look after your pet? We don't see it very often, I have to say, and I think that's, that's fair enough because I think family members will obviously look after the pet or find the right, right place for them. Um, but if you don't have a large family and you think, actually, there is somebody I would like you know, my, my pet to be looked after by, then you can indicate it in the will. If you have larger animals, um, perhaps horses or goats or things like that, then an animal sanctuary or charity might be the answer. 
and also think about whether you want to leave something to that person or the charity to look after the pet. Okay, so we've done the bits and pieces before we get to the assets, and now we can look at exactly how the assets are going to be distributed. Now, the first thing that we can think about is if you've got particular items, and by that I mean, you know, your personal chattels, so jewellery, furniture, cars, paintings, things like that, that you would like to pass on to specific people, then you can include them in your will. Um, you can have a whole list, actually, if you want to, but... Um, I would prefer to go with the second option there, which is simply to leave all your personal chattels to your executors to distribute in accordance with the letter that you complete during your lifetime. Now, the advantage of that approach is that you can change the letter that you've written over time. So if you change your mind over perhaps an item or, or indeed um, the beneficiary, you can just change the letter itself and you don't have to go to the extra cost then of uh, completing a new will. We then move on to whether you want to leave any specific amount, so cash, to individuals. As to how much you include, that's entirely up to you. Um, it can go to family, friends or charities. Again, with charities, uh, if it's a UK charity or an EU charity, it'll pass to them free of inheritance tax. The one point that I would make at this point is that actually these legacies will get paid before the residue passes to your main beneficiaries. So be careful about how much you are to leave because obviously if you leave large legacies here and for whatever reason the rest of your estate dwindles away to the point where actually there's nothing for the residuary beneficiaries, they're probably not going to be very happy. So that's, that's just something to bear in mind. In terms of the currency, usually it would be sterling obviously because it's an English will, it doesn't have to be. So if you think that actually it's better for dollars to be paid, US dollars or any other currency to a beneficiary, then that can be included within the will itself. The final point is index linking that legacy. Now, generally speaking, I would say most people don't do this and I think that's probably sensible, but you can, you can index link the legacy in the will itself. So let's say for instance, I decide to leave £10,000 to my godson. In 10 years' time, it's still £10,000. It won't have increased with inflation. If you index link it, obviously, hopefully, it's going to be worth more than £10,000. So, you know, that sort of makes sense. The downside, however, is that if you were to leave much bigger legacies over a longer period of time, and perhaps a number of legacies, you can see that maybe you know, that's going to eat into what's left for the residuary beneficiaries. Now, I have seen this in practice and it, it, it wasn't a problem because the residuary beneficiaries actually received um, quite large substantial gifts during their lifetime, but it is just something to bear in mind. So we then come on to what's left. So the residuary amount of money is a pot of money or assets uh, which is left over after all the legacies have been paid, the taxes have been paid, the administration expenses have been paid, and the executors then distribute the funds in accordance with the terms of the will. Now, in your will, you can either leave the funds absolutely to people, or you could leave it into some form of trust fund. And the two trust funds that we tend to see more often than not are firstly a life interest trust, and that um, is very useful where there is a second marriage um, because what our clients will want to do is to still benefit their current spouse in some way um, but also benefit the children from their former marriage and this would certainly work in that regards the income would be paid to their current spouse and then when they die the capital elements of that trust will then pass on to the children from the first marriage so that that sort of works from a tax perspective it's completely neutral, so when the surviving spouse uh, does pass away, then it will aggregate with their own estate for inheritance tax. The other type of trust is a discretionary trust of residue, and that can be used, you know, it's a very flexible arrangement. It can be used where you know the beneficiaries that you do want to benefit, but you're not quite sure in what proportions. And there might be other reasons why you're not quite sure, 
Um, again, they could be spendthrifts or they might be going through a divorce or possibly even bankruptcy, things like that. And at the moment, you, you want to hedge your bets as to where the funds are going to go. You will be relying upon the trustees to make the right choice, um, but you would include all the potential beneficiaries in the will itself and the trustees will then decide um, as to how the funds are then distributed. What you would do during your lifetime is again complete a separate letter addressed to your trustees laying out how you'd like the funds to be dealt with. And as time goes on, you can then change that letter. So it, it, it's a very flexible arrangement. The downside, of course, is that you will be relying upon the trustees to make the right decision. But if you trust your chosen executives and trustees, then it shouldn't be a problem. And there's probably no real reason why they, they won't follow that letter unless there's tax reasons or other reasons uh, to do with the beneficiaries themselves. Minor beneficiaries. So at what age are you happy for your minor beneficiaries to inherit under the terms of your will? They'll take at the age of 18, that's the age at which they can give a receipt, but we commonly see the ages of 21 and 25 included. That could be when they're coming out of university and they might be looking to maybe set up home or even buy things like cars you know, for transport to get to and from work. So again, it's entirely up to you. I have seen older, I have seen 50, 50 years of age. As you can possibly imagine, they were not very happy with that. Um, so I don't really recommend that. It can cause your executives and trustees a bit of a headache. Charities. So again, I touched upon this previously, but uh, obviously you can leave your estate to charities and any assets that pass to the charity will be free from inheritance tax. Um, equally, if you leave 10% or more to a charity, then actually it reduces the inheritance tax rate within your estate to 36%. So that's also worth, worth thinking about. In terms of how you divvy out the estate, it can go equally, so they can receive equal shares, or you might want to leave certain percentages. So one beneficiary might receive 20%, another 30, etc. As long as that adds up to 100%, that's entirely up to you. The final point there, fallback beneficiaries. And by that, I mean, these are the beneficiaries that will take in the event that your firstly chosen beneficiaries have already passed away. So again, charities are quite a good choice for that if you don't have a very big family, but we, we also see nephews and nieces in there as well. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Next slide, thank you. So that's really the sort of template for um, your will. And I think that that will be quite useful as I said at the start for those that haven't yet completed a will and also those that have but can now review um, there will against those those particular points. Actually, at this point, we're going to do another poll, actually. And um, the question that is going to be asked is what percentage of UK adults who need a will actually have one? And that's running through quite quickly, which is good. Very interesting. We have used this question before, so I think some people might have been on the same one, the same webinar previously. Um, is that it? I think it is. Excellent. And yep, 76% there have got it right. It's 46%, which I think is particularly low actually and I think it's one of those it's one of those problems in the UK and I guess it's probably a worldwide sort of problem um, it's not the most exciting subject and I think when we get inquiries from clients about wills we write to them and explain what they need to think about and it's then put on the back burner I would obviously encourage you to um, get a will completed as quickly as possible um, there is no right age for that Okay, so if we can then move on to the next slide, please. So we're now going to look at the role of the executor and uh, exactly what they have to do in the administration of an estate. Before we get on to that point, I'm just going to cover three, three um, words, really. What is an executor? 
what is an administrator and what is a trustee? And these get confused by people. So an executor is effectively the person who is appointed as the person to deal with your estate in your will. So there is a will in place and there is a person appointed. An administrator is the person that handles the estate where there is no will. A trustee is the person who will deal with any trusts that are created under the terms of that will. So fairly straightforward, but they do get confused. So who can be an executor? Well, again, it's entirely up to you, but family, friends, and indeed professionals, and we're gonna look at uh, in, in a minute um, why you might want to think about appointing a professional in that role. Um, we talked about the, the numbers of executors. They do have to be over the age of 18 and they do have to be compensamentous, but other than that, you're free to appoint whoever you want. Next slide, please, Peter. Thank you. So we then look at what an executor actually has to do. And it can be fairly complex. Um, it depends upon the assets of the estate. It depends upon the circumstances of, of the deceased. The first thing they're going to have to do is try and locate where the will is. That's vitally important. Um, and, and the reason for that is that they're trying to identify principally at that stage whether there's any funeral arrangements, you know, funeral wishes in that will. Once they've identified that, they can then arrange for the funeral to be arranged and also the death to be registered. They don't have to actually arrange it themselves, but they do need to make sure it happens. You need to identify the beneficiaries in the will. So are they of age, for instance? Are they all over the age of 18? Can, they, can assets be passed to them or is it going to be necessary to involve the parents at that stage? Um, so that's, that, that's vitally important. Are the addresses correct in the will? You know, these are, some wills are completed 20 odd years ago. The chances are those, those addresses are going to be wrong and have any of the beneficiaries already passed away. So it's important to identify exactly whether the beneficiaries are all still alive. The next stage is largely to identify the assets and you'll need to write out to all the various institutions to see what the value is. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to identify the value of, of, of the assets and also identify any debts or liabilities that might have been held by the deceased at the date that they die. And the reason for that is you're trying to get to a point where you can apply for the grant of probate. Um, the chances are you're going to be involved in dealing with assets overseas, certainly from our client base, that's the case. So you're gonna be dealing with financial institutions, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, what you're trying to do, as I say, is trying to formulate a picture of the assets and indeed the liabilities. Now, the reason for that is that you will need to complete an inheritance tax return in the UK if you have assets here. And indeed, if they're overseas and you are domiciled in the UK. Now, it's very important um, to identify the values because tax has to be paid on those assets before you can apply for the grant of probate. It doesn't have to be paid instantly on real estate. That can be paid by 10 yearly instalments, but it will be, have to be paid on everything else. Once you've paid your tax, you'll get a receipt from, the, uh, from HMRC, and then you can apply for a UK grant of probate. You'll also need to think about whether there's any foreign grants to be, to be obtained. Certainly, we get involved in applying for grants in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Jersey, you know, the Channel Islands, also Ireland. Ireland has a lot of administration centres now for financial institutions. And I don't think people realise that actually the asset is based there and we will need to get a grant of probate in Ireland. It can take up to six months to get a grant of probate in Ireland. And indeed, uh, it can take a long time in other jurisdictions as well. Also need to think about whether there's any tax due in those jurisdictions. So once you've paid your tax and you've got your grant of probate, you can then think about collecting in the assets and distributing those assets in accordance with the terms of the will. You will, of course, have to settle any outstanding uh, legacies and other liabilities. And in terms of distribution, then you don't have to sell everything. 
if there are some assets that the beneficiaries want to to keep then they can do so as long as you've got enough money to pay obviously for the debts and the other liabilities then that's absolutely fine so once you've paid everything you can then distribute in accordance with the terms of the will and um, you'll also need to complete an administration tax return so you've already done your one to the date of death but actually there will be one due from the date of death through to the end of the administration and that will obviously cover things like any gains that might have been made on the assets during the estate or any income that's been received during that period that's going to be taxable so once you've done all that you've come to the end of the estate and you can then detail everything to your beneficiaries and normally what we would do is we would complete a full set of accounts and uh, send that out to the beneficiaries to approve in terms of what makes the perfect executor um, I think that's that's a personal decision um, I think there's three main attributes that I would like to go with um, they have to be trustworthy and I think generally speaking they're going to be I mean otherwise you wouldn't be appointing them but they have got to be able to step back from any any arguments amongst family members and death I'm afraid does do funny things to families so they shouldn't be influenced by emotion they should be able to stand back from any arguments look at both sides and then make a decision they've got to be very organized there's always a lot of paperwork involved um, and you are going to be dealing with different organizations who can drag their heels I'm afraid so it must be organized and they've also got to have the time you know they've got to be available to handle the the, the administration um, so they've got to have the time to be you know to be able to actually finalize everything what you would tend to find is that the estate will run quite smoothly and then there's always something which sticks and um, it, it can take a long time to actually deal with it but you've got to get it over the line so time is 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 very very important so let's go on to the next slide so i just want to touch upon briefly really the advantage of appointing a professional perhaps alongside family members um, i've already highlighted what i think are the attributes of an executor the perfect executor and these sort of fit in now these these points on this slide fit in with those three attributes that so a professional should have the time um, it's what they do all day they will be independent so they can step away from the arguments look at both sides and come down to a decision ultimately the executor should make a decision even if it's not liked by the beneficiaries they are able to take that decision once they get the grant probate they'll be in a better position probably to understand the law of succession certainly should be if they're specialists in that field if they don't know the answer immediately then they'll be able to go and find out and i would say they'll be able to find it out quicker than somebody googling it um, and it's probably going to be more accurate they can be complex estates can be complex some aren't but they can be complex and the points there that i've put on the slide inheritance tax returns there's two one is a straightforward iht 205 where basically tax isn't paid that's fairly straightforward the other one the iht 400 can run up to over 90 pages and uh, that can be difficult that's going to be needed where tax is payable or where we run into a domicile claim situation also foreign aspects and that moves us really on to the the last point there in terms of tax treaties so are there any tax treaties in place between the UK and other countries which might be applicable and that will then mean that only one tax will apply to the assets um, other specialists legal and tax knowledge deeds of variation that's a document that can be completed after the date of death and can vary the terms of the will for that particular beneficiary tax reliefs they're going to be known by the you know professional that's what they're doing they're using those all the time and we talked about domicile claims so all those points I think that that that's certainly the advantage and uh, you'll find that a professional such as Fry's will be able to work alongside uh, family members uh, or indeed we do act for our clients in a sole capacity as well okay Steve thank you so much uh, as always, it's been great to listen to Steve. He's got such a, a depth of knowledge and expertise. Uh, so what are the key takeaways for today? 
firstly, get that will written. It's very, very important to get that sorted out. Secondly, that will can be a very important weapon in the arsenal we use to tackle your inheritance tax bill. Uh, remember back to my slide, Catherine, when Catherine passed away, there was a million pounds to pay. And finally, think about who, the, who is the right person to look after things once you've passed away. Is a professional going to be the right answer for you? So those are my key takeaways for today. So what we're going to do now, this is the exciting bit, I like this, is we're going to have a look at some of the questions you've actually been asking. So, oh my goodness me, there's a lot of questions. I'm not sure we're going to get to all of these. Um, but what I'll do is try and look through and pick out uh, some of these questions for Steve. Okay. So I'll pick up on one. Can an additional executor be added to an existing will as a signed addendum, or does the whole will need changing and re-signing? Okay, that's quite a simple one, actually. Um, you would need to complete a codicil um, to that, th that will. Uh, you can't just simply add it to your existing will. Um, so, I mean, it can be done two ways. Yes, yes, you can complete a new will. And actually, for our clients, generally speaking, we, we don't complete codicils because it's just as easy to, to draw up the previously drafted will and add in the executor. Um, but generally speaking, if you were going to a high street solicitor, they will probably say to you, yeah, you know, just, just complete a codicil to add the executor in. And, and then that codicil is effectively then read back into the will. Okay, thanks, Steve. I've got a couple of questions very much on the same theme, and I'm not sure how you're going to answer this one. <laughs> so does Brexit affect EU succession agreements? And the simple to that is... Certainly, as far as the EU succession regulation is concerned, no, it doesn't. Um, simply because the UK never signed up to the EU succession regulation anyway. Uh, they were joined with Denmark and Ireland, actually, in not signing up for it. So even if, for instance, you were based in the US, the, the same rule applies. So as far as the EU succession regulation is concerned, it'll make no difference at all. No. OK, thanks. So, do you have to involve solicitors to have a valid will? Um, no, you don't, um, is the honest truth. Uh, you can obviously complete the will yourself if you want to. I wouldn't recommend that. I think there are problems, you know, problems do arise and I've seen that happen um, in that a will hasn't been completed correctly. It's then invalid when the person dies. And unfortunately, uh, you then have to turn to the rules of intestacy. Um, so in answer to the question, no, you don't have to. It does have to comply with certain rules. So it does have to be in writing and it must be signed and witnessed in the correct way. Um, but I, my advice to you would be go and get that will completed by uh, somebody who is used to, to completing wills. Okay, thank you. So next question multiple wills. So if I have a property and savings in another country, for example, Portugal, would it be better to just have a will that covers this and other assets are included in another will? I think it, I mean, you know, I talked about domicile previously, so it's largely going to come down to where you're domiciled. Um, and this, you know, so really my, my comments would be, um, make sure you get the will complete in accordance with where you're domiciled. And then if you do have perhaps assets in Portugal, if that's where it is, then go and get the advice in Portugal. As far as Portugal is concerned, obviously it's in the EU. So, you know, you'll be able to rely upon your UK will to cover assets in that jurisdiction. As I said earlier, it, there might be other reasons. And again, I would say get the advice in Portugal, but there may be other reasons why it's sensible to have separate wills because it'll be dealt with quicker but you don't want to have too many wills in place. Thank you very much. Okay, if a side letter is changed, how does anyone know if I changed it or somebody else? Well, unless, 
unless they forged your signature, I mean, the, the, the letter should be signed and dated. And I would say address that uh, letter to your executors and trustees. Um, you can then sign the letter, date it, hold it then with the original will, and then you tear up the old letter so there's only one in place. I mean, it's, it, you know, if somebody were to forge the letter, there's nothing you can do about that. That's the same with a will. Um, so you're in exactly the same situation. Thank you. Is there such a thing as an international will? Um, I think it's just a term that's, that's banded around. I, you know, basically, you, you know, you could argue that an, an international will is, is a UK will which covers assets around the globe. That's, that's, that's effectively what we're talking about here. Um, so it's just a term which is used to cover wills which, which cover different jurisdictions, that's all. Okay. Let's just have a look. Okay. Can the sole executor of, a, of an estate be a beneficiary of that estate? Yes, they can. Yeah, absolutely. It is a question which crops up quite a lot, actually. We do get asked that. And um, certainly, without doubt, that yes, you know, they, they can. I mean, and if you think about it, actually, if you're appointing your surviving spouse, they're likely to be the main beneficiary of your estate. So absolutely no problem at all. Yeah. Okay. So but they you... shouldn't be a witness to your will. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's the one point oh. I should make. Is okay. the beneficiary shouldn't be a witness because obviously the courts might well they will question that yes uh, i've read so many john grisham books about that okay <laughs> do you have advice about choosing someone to help write the will yes i mean i think i would i would certainly say a a professional somebody who has been dealing with um uh you know drafting wills for some time you will find that high street solicitors do have different practices i mean fries for instance you know we've been drafting wills for our clients for a number of years and because a lot of our clients are based overseas we are slightly ahead of local high street solicitors because we we have that foreign element um so we know what we're looking for so um i personally i would say if you're a client of fries then come and have a chat to us and we can certainly get get a will prepared for you. Um, I think you just need to make sure that they are competent enough. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of will writers out there and they're charging a lot of money. You don't need to spend a huge amount of money, but it's all about value for money, you know, at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Next question, can I add a clause to my UK will to cover my holiday apartment in Switzerland, or should I obtain a Swiss will? Switzerland's actually a little different. It's, it's very similar actually to the EU succession regulation. So uh, you will be able to complete a UK will, um, I believe. I mean, I, again, I would say to you, because I'm not an expert on Swiss law, but I, again, I would say, go and get the advice in Switzerland. But my understanding is that you will be able to cover in your UK will, if you put a clause in your UK will that it covers your assets in Switzerland, that will be sufficient. Okay, thank you. Can the executor to a UK will be a foreign national? Can the executor be a foreign national? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's, no, there's no problem with that at all, um, as long as they meet the criteria that they're over the age of 18 and are compass mentors, then actually you can point anybody you like. They can't be... Um, you know, if somebody's bankrupt, they can't be an executor. Um, but other than that, yeah, there's no problem appointing a foreign national yeah, to a UK will. Yeah. Are there any special considerations in leaving a legacy to a disabled relative? Yes, I mean, obviously, you would need to think about uh, their own income position. Now, they might be you know, receiving benefit from the government. Um, so the amount that you pay to them, does that impact on their, their income that they're currently receiving? That's the first thing that I would, you know, think about. If that's the case, then a trust of some description might be the, you know, the best option. Um, a discretionary trust is an option. 
so that you would include them as one of the potential beneficiaries and also other beneficiaries as well. But if you're looking, you know, you could just simply turn around and say, it doesn't matter about how much, you know, or indeed whether it impacts on their own income, I still want to pass an amount of money to them because they're going to be better off anyway. Then actually the best route would probably be a discretionary trust so that you, the trustees can then manage the funds for them. Um, so that's, that's probably the best route to take, I would say. Okay, thank you. So who should be chosen to witness a will? Uh, what if he or she cannot be located? I'm not quite sure about the second part of that, but who should be chosen to witness a will? I mean, strictly speaking, anybody can act as a witness, um, as I say, other than somebody who's been included as a, as, as a beneficiary under the will. I, I certainly, you know, obviously don't include a beneficiary, but anybody could be a witness. Um, I get the point about, you know, if the courts were to come back after the person's died and say, there's a bit of a, an issue with the will, we need to speak to the witnesses. Um, in the will itself, it will state their addresses. So that's a starting point in trying to locate those, those uh, witnesses. Um, now, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter who it is. I mean, the chances are that people move around, um, but at least they would have the address, you know, their original address, so that you can start inquiring as to where they, they might be. Um, but it can be, it can be anybody, but they must be in the same same room really you know they've got to be in the, in the presence of the testator to sign the will and also in each other's presence um so in answer to the question it doesn't really matter who it is subject to them being again of age um and and indeed being compass mentis okay well, i think we've got time just for one last question we, we have a lot of questions so apologies if we didn't get mm. to you um, but does the side letter need to be verified? Um, this is, I'm not sure whether that relates to any, any of the side letters that I've talked about. Um, the simple answer is no, it doesn't. I mean, if we're looking at the discretionary trust, for instance, then um, that just needs to be signed by the trustee, the uh, testator, and it just needs to be dated. Um, and that, that would then just be held with the, you know, with the will. So um, no, it doesn't have to be verified by anybody, but I would say, you know, the best thing is to, to obviously hold that with the will, which hopefully will be the, which is held by a professional perhaps um, in their safe custody. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. That's been absolutely fantastic. As always, I can't catch you out on a question. So um, your <laughs> all is intact. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank okay. you. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention today. That, that's very much appreciated. And I know many of you who are joining today are very familiar with the Fry Group. But for those of you who may be new to us, I'm just going to give a really brief introduction to, to who we are just over a couple of slides. Uh, so we were established more than 120 years ago. And since then, we've helped thousands of people around the world and across the generations. Uh, today, we're looking at eight offices around the world so we can offer a, a truly global perspective. Our services cover, cover three core areas of financial planning, tax, estates, and investments. And our teams work together across these three areas and across countries to create the right balance for each client. And our core purpose is to create financial freedom for our clients. And we understand that means different things to different people. So we take the time to find out what is important to you so we can structure your finances around your goals. Okay, so the last slide I'm gonna leave you with just for a couple of minutes is our address uh, in, in various offices. So uh, please do feel free to contact us. We can let you have a copy of the slides. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd be great to hear from you, thank you.